Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. My name's Elizabeth Townsend Guard, and I'm the host, and this is Just Want a Quilt. Hi, welcome to Just Want a Quilt. This is our first show, and it's kind of a preview show. What I thought I'd do is talk to you about the guests that we're going to have on this first season. So far, we've recorded over 60 interviews, and we're going to try to do some more. Um, and what we're trying to do in this, with this podcast is really understand the world of quilting. Who quilts? Why they quilt? Who are the quilt entrepreneurs? Who are the big industry people? Cool designers, famous quilters, all kinds of things. And why we're doing this is so that I can have a better understanding of the quilting world as I work in understanding the underlying copyright, trademark, patents, and other aspects that protect, legally protect, um, these works. So, this is going to be a little compilation of sort of what's to come, and I hope you enjoy it, and I so hope you listen to our show. Um, I'm pretty psyched. I really like um, getting to know people and understanding why they, like me, just want to quilt. Um, so my first memory of doing sewing is different than my first memories of sewing happening. Because The first thread line we ever carried was a metallic thread. And metallic thread still to this day, uh, unfortunately, has kind of a, a, a bad reputation for being a very difficult thread. <laughs> is that a good yeah. Thread? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was basically the idea of if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Uh, so we're also really interested in the concept of quilt, the quilt entrepreneur. So in some ways, this has changed over time um, as the internet became more and more and more and more. Um, but we're talking to people about how they began their businesses, how they, um, what role social media plays in their business, um, and sort of other things like their thoughts about just being in the quilting world. So this is from people who make patterns that are just beginning to make patterns and are begin, have, be, have found some success with it, like um, Orange Dot Quilts and uh, Dora Carey, Talia Day, and Vanessa Wilson, who are these incredibly savvy, business-smart women who have um, amassed uh, a empire of sorts, each of them, on the Internet. Um, and they're awesome, and they talk to us about what they do. To um, to Superior Threads and how that began, to Judelle Nehemiah and how her mom, how she t- helped her mom take her very popular patterns into this huge, uh, incredible empire again. So we're really interested in understanding um, how these businesses get built um, and what role... Um, we as consumers play in um, making them successful. Um, it's cool. So I hope you enjoy those too. Well, I was so excited to find somebody who shared my passion for both quilts and the law. Uh, I, I, at least I would like to get that credit. Okay, this is a, a quilt that I made patterned by Orange Dot Quilts. That's all. Uh, and that will help everybody. I don't see how that is harmful in any way to anyone. You know, yeah. just uh, giving credit where it's due. That was the one thing that, like, you know, I like the the one thing was like I always, with my business background, I always said, okay, what's the demographics I'm targeting, right? So like, I feel like the demographics I'm targeting is like um, anywhere from 28 to, gosh. 65, 70, 80, like there's really no like age top there. Like I don't, but like I target, the reason why I move around is because there's, I always think about myself. Like I think about like as a mom, how, how, like what's the logistics of me getting away? And so we interviewed Amy Newbold from uh, Sotopia. And Bob Ruhelio from the Quilt Market and Quilt Festival. And we'll continue to try to get an insider's view into these shows and tourism and retreats and spaces that we all love to visit. 
Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 Hours idea yeah, I do um, from his book. Yeah. And, and I believe that that really, that was the work. I put the work in. And... And I and I just I still to this day I go to Cool Guilds and, and talk about it and it's, it's really uh, by cool. far in a way my my most booked uh, lecture. <laughs> yeah. To uh, a lot of other activities, for instance, I in the past uh, served as a quilting consultant to thread manufacturers, uh, fabric manufacturers. And I think the, the reason is that I was out on the field uh, talking to quilters, knowing what they were wanted, and I could bring that information back. Famous quilters stopped by, like Cheryl Sloboda and Nina Paley and Hollis Turnbow. Um, and we've had historians so far, like Barbara Brackman and Pam Weeks. And we have more scheduled. We're super psyched about this. That willingness to step in and um, offer a suggestion, offer to share some fabric, but mostly just the encouragement. Yeah. I found to be just phenomenal. And especially for me starting out um, with all of my insecurities, right. <laughs> that, that's a very meaningful. Cool Market was founded, the fall edition was founded in 1979, and then we had a spring edition in 1981. In 1979, that sort of makes sense, right? So we get the bicentennial where there's a kind of resurgence of quilting and interest in quilting, and then by 79, there's enough interest to have a... Another really important aspect of this project is community. For a long time, I've done projects... Um, some that were very quiet and kind of individualistic. My, my doctoral work was I just researched a bunch of stuff um, all by myself and sometimes talked with people. It was kind of lonely. And then I had another project called The Durationator, and that's a, been going for about 10 years, and that's awesome. I connect to community, and that's super great. And lots of students. There's been over 90 students that have worked on the project um, along with many 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 classes um but now that I'm a full professor which means I'm no longer like officially judged um in the same way as a junior professor um I was ready for something different and so this project reflects that I wanted a project first that was fun which this one is totally fun um but also one that I would um, have community and chat with people and so part of that is that we have a quilting army which is all the people who are willing to play play whether it's scholars who come and chat or um, people that pitch in to think about like what should the logo be or go on field trips or whatever it is I really think this project's about community so I hope that when you hear this that you go to our Facebook page or our Facebook group we have both join it like it um, and be part of this. I want to hear your stories. I want you to be part of these these conversations about what it means to quilt. I think it means a lot of things. Um, but at the heart of it, there's a lot of love. There's a lot of creativity. There's a lot of community. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot of consumerism. And there's a lot of invention and entrepreneurship. Um, it's fun. It's really fun. So I hope you enjoy these interviews. These are our first season of interviews, which is trying to get sort of the landscape of the quilting world and why people quilt. Um, there are so far 60 of them. I'm hoping we, we get more. Um, I'm hoping we get to 100 in this first season. Because there are so many cool stories to learn. I was, it, I was clergy for a long time, and um, Episcopal clergy, and my skill set was in outreach and um, pastoral care and as I worked with our patients, people that were perhaps they were terminally ill, going through a divorce, had a kid on drugs or whatever it was, if I could sit with them and work with them and get them doing something with their hands, whether it was stitching creative writing, embroidery, 
painting, whatever it was, it would get their minds off of whatever their, the, uh, the trauma or anxiety producing issue was in their family or in their life and, and give them a little comfort. And um, I wanted to do that for a long time as my, as my living. So That was Emma Connolly of Uptown Needle and Craftwork talking about why she opened a shop. We talked to, talked to other shops like Copper Can, Canyon Quilting and uh, Mizumi and other shops all over the country and we're talking to more. Each shop has its own story and um, they've been really interesting to hear. Um, the stories of not only the owners but people who work at shops like um, Gigi at Uptown Needle Needle and Craftworks, or um, uh, Rachel at Visami. Oh, sorry, Rachel at um, uh, Quilted Owl. Um, and so we want to hear from the. We want to hear more from the, the of those stories as well. Kind of back into the answer to that question, and and I guess the long and the short of it is that I have had a career of representing very large corporations. And my intent isn't to get the business. And I think instead, I want to educate people so that they can have the tools to handle their own legal issues. Because getting a lawyer or having a lawyer is expensive. Right. And I don't think it's right that lawyers hoard their special knowledge um, because it can be taught and my intention is to teach people a large framework and, and to let them have the tools to, to figure out the answers. Also see that in this industry, I think there's a lot of misinformation in thinking that intellectual property protects more than it does. And I encourage people to collaborate and share their intellectual property instead of trying to hold on to it. I just, I think it's better for the designer, I think it gets them more, more exposure, which translates into more success. And, and I just encourage people not to try to use the law as some sort of sword. That was Heather Kubiak talking about her philosophy of quilting and the law. We'll hear more from her and all kinds of other people. So what's this podcast about? It's about stories about quilters, just us regular quilters. What we like, what we don't like, why we quilt, why it matters in our lives. That's how the project started. I wanted to understand why I just wanted to quilt and why others like me just wanted to quilt. I, I like to machine piece, but I hand quilt when I can. Um, I really enjoy the hand quilting and I have hand quilted several bed size quilts over the years. Um, now, currently, I don't have as much time because we do foster care. So when there isn't a baby in the house, I do these quick uh, little tied baby comforters that I give away with the foster kids and to other charitable organizations. Follow them, you know. And I really don't remember why my mother and her two sisters why they started quilting, but they started quilting about the same time. And that was also about well, less than 15 years ago. And uh, they went to a quilt shop in Branson, uh, Missouri, and they each bought a <laughs> kit to make a French rose quilt. And being the thrifty people they are <laughs> out of the quilt out of the kit for one quilt they probably at least got three quilts a piece <laughs> out of that because no scrap was right. uh -huh. left undone and that uh -huh. pattern you know afforded is well and I definitely um I picked the current the current one I'm doing um the piece thing is very easy um but I did pick it because I have a very ambitious idea for how I want to quilt it 
Yeah. Um, and that, that's sort of why 